Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about that huge game in the ACC, Pitt and Clemson, one of those games that we're getting close to the end of the season. We're going to see quite a few elimination games around here. And also, I do want to apologize for the title. I've been trying to update it the entire show, and I do not know why it's not going up. I promise you, we are talking college football in here, and we will continue to do that. But let's get into these SEC upset alerts, because we got Texas heading over to Arkansas. We have LSU going on the road to Florida Two very interesting spots, and I wanted to break down these games, and the first one I think is special for reasons beyond even this year, because this is a rivalry. Whether, uh, you know, you're if you're 13, if you're 14, even if you're 18, honestly, you might not even know that this is a rivalry. This one's special. These teams hate each other, and you will feel it in Arkansas Stadium, or in Razorback Stadium on Saturday, even if it's at noon. It is going to be absolutely rocking. These teams played every single year from 1932 to 1991 in the Southwest Conference, and they hate each other. It's going to be really, really special. The only time these two teams have gone uh, or have played each other under the current head coaches was back in Steve Sarkeesian's first year at Texas and Sam Pittman's second year at Arkansas. It was one of the most thorough beatings that Texas has taken since Steve Sarkeesian took over as head coach. It was an absolute beating. I believe they had 59 total yards of offense. It was domination, and it gave you an idea of just how far Texas has come over the last couple of years because they uh, beat Alabama last year in, in uh, Tuscaloosa. So it gives you an idea of just how far Sark has brought that team from a physicality perspective because they got downright bullied in that game, no doubt about that. But Texas is looking for a ton of momentum right now, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. They're trying to continue to roll into Fayetteville and take advantage of that pass defense that let Jackson Dart go for over 500 passing yards on them. Obviously, I expect them to be a little bit more well-equipped in this one, but definitely something where Texas is trying to keep that thing rolling, keep that downfield passing game rolling in. This seems to be a team that you can definitely do it against. And then Arkansas has been a team that's reeling just a little bit lately the uh, status of Sam Pittman becomes a little bit more up in the air than it felt after that Tennessee game earlier in the year but they do get a bye to get healthy and hopefully Taylor Green will be in this we'll actually talk about that here in a second but they're looking for another huge win and frankly I think if they get this win I think Sam Pittman's safe uh, I think he would be, get that huge win that would totally get all the boosters on his side because again the boosters a lot of the boosters for Arkansas grew up in the era when they were uh, playing this team every single uh, every single year. They grew up in the era where all of these was one of the biggest games of the entire year across college football. So it's going to be important to them. If he wins this one, then I'd bet you see, you'll see Sam Pittman in Fayetteville in 2025. I can't bet on that, but definitely something that I feel pretty good about. And then Texas getting a win would just be, and you'd be in great position. You would get past one of these big-time landmine spots on the road. You'd have Kentucky at home, and then you'd have the big one against A&M that has been 13 years of buildup in the making. It could be for an SEC uh, spot. It could be for a CFP berth. A million things on the table in that game, but Texas has got to take care, uh, care of business in this one before we get get there. So very much want that to happen, but Arkansas very much does not want it to happen. So we'll break it down as it goes on, but Andrew Armstrong is someone that I want you guys to watch in this game because I just outright think this is the most underrated player in the sport. He is so good. Every time that I watch Arkansas, number two pops up time and again. He is so incredible in that pass offense. He's one of the most dynamic players. His catch radius is just out of this world. And in a world where we see so many incredible wide receivers all over the field or all over the country, this might be the best wide receiver on the field on Saturday. As crazy as that sounds with Isaiah Bond on the field as well, and I think it's as close as you possibly want to make it, and I wouldn't be mad at you if you leaned Isaiah Bond, but the physicality, the energy, and the versatility of this kid is just out of this world, and I think he's someone that Texas has been good at stopping the pass thus far. This might be the best uh, wide receiver they've faced this entire season. And then you got TJ Metcalf on the back end of that defense, and we talked about it. Texas wants to get that pass game going. They want to push the ball downfield. This guy's a turnover machine. He's very, very good at hunting the ball. He has three picks on the season, has a forced fumble. He's one of those guys that absolutely can change this game on a dime. And if we watch this game, I think objectively everyone says they're probably going to need a couple of turnovers to get this one done. Quinn Ewers has been prone to giving away the ball a couple of times during that stretch where it seemed like he was a little bit less healthy, but still, the opening is there to be had. TJ Metcalf's probably the guy to watch for that. Then DeAndre Moore is the guy I want to talk about, and he's someone that really struggled last week. He had uh, two drops, 
one wasn't quite as bad of a drop as the other one. There was one drop over the middle of the field that he just outright should have caught. There was another one in the end zone that a little bit tougher. Not nearly as mad about him, uh, at him for that one, but I think it just... I, I'm betting on him. I, I'm betting on the person uh, behind the pads because I think he is just itching to get back on the field. He's a very, very talented, very fast, and kind of the leader of that wide receiver room in a, in a lot of ways because he's been at Texas for quite some time, and he's such an important player on that team. He does everything. He does that Jordan Whittington role from the past year where he's going to do all the blocking. He's going to do all the tough work, and I think he really wants to get back out, on there, out, out there on that field and make a couple of big plays, and I expect him to, if I'm being totally honest. And then you got Michael Taff on the back end of that at Texas defense. If you have not watched this kid, go ahead and do yourself a favor and watch him because he is so much fun. He flies around the field. He plays with reckless abandonment. He is as cool of a player as there is across the country. And I think when you come into a game where you have a mobile quarterback, you're going to need someone from the safety level to come down and be able to help and run support. It's exactly what this kid does, and he comes with a vengeance. But some keys to the game, a reignited rivalry. Obviously, that's going to play a role in this one. This is a, a coach in Sam Pittman that absolutely loves everything Arkansas. For Steve Sarkeesian, a little bit newer to the Texas world, but absolutely loves that university, understands the history of this game, and not uh, and on top of all of that, the fans in the crowd, a lot of them understand what this one's about, and it's going to be really, really special, and that place is going to be rocking. I don't care if it was noon or 2 a.m. or in the middle of a pasture field at 5 a.m. They're going to be loud, they're going to be there, and it's going to be incredible to watch this one get reignited. And then the Texas line of scrimmage play is going to be interesting to watch for me. The O-line has struggled of, uh, as recent, and when you look at that Arkansas-Tennessee game, that was kind of what they did well. They got after Nico Iamaliava, they forced him to make some mistakes, and definitely uh, had that downfield passing game really struggling in that one. And Travaris Jackson deserves a ton of respect for that as well, but it's definitely going to be huge for Texas to get that run game going. They did a good job late in that game against Florida. I bet you see a little bit more Jarrett Gibson in that aggressive run game in this one as well. But finally, Taylor Green's status is huge. Uh, they got by week to get him a little bit more healthy. How healthy is he is really the thing I'm coming down to. I think he will go. I don't think it'll be Malachi Singleton. If it is, then give me Texas and give me uh, them by a lot. But at the end of the day, if Taylor Green does go, if he's at 80%, is that enough for him to push them with his legs? If he's at 90%, is that enough? If he's at 100 you feel great going into this. But what is his percentage level in? How much do you need to get that run game going the way that you want it to? I'm going to go Texas in this one. I, I really can't uh, think of a reason why Arkansas is going to be able to get this one done unless they're able to totally stifle this Texas offense the way that it had been in a couple of other games. There is a world where that happens. I think Arkansas is a little bit tapped out on the season. I'll be totally honest with you. And I think Texas is kind of surging. I expect to see a pretty comfortable performance. Maybe Arkansas scores a late touchdown to make it a little bit closer. But I think Texas gets a pretty comfortable win and continues on their way. And then we got a huge one in the swamp that is going to be very fascinating to watch because you have an LSU team that is still in the conference mix. As crazy as that sounds, what they need is they need to win out the rest of the way, obviously. Then they need Georgia to win this weekend. Then they need South Carolina and Arkansas to knock off Missouri to finish off the year. If they get all of those things, which sounds a little bit far-fetched, but South Carolina's favored over uh, Missouri this week, Georgia's favored over Tennessee. So it could just be going to the very end of the year for this one. But LSU's got to take care of business business in Gainesville first, obviously. But I know that it's going to be really, really uh, interesting to watch all of this kind of unfold. And I think one of the biggest things here as we get into this game is DJ Lagway. Is he a go? How close to 100% is he? Kind of like the tail and green thing. They're going to need his legs to win this game. We've shown that LSU cannot necessarily handle that part of an offense. If you can get him out on the edge, you're going to have a lot of success. I tend to believe he's going to go. I tend to believe he's going to be 85%, 80% maybe, but it's going to be really interesting to see what he can do, and is it just the downfield passing game, or is it a little bit more of that run game that they've been really good at getting going when he is healthy, so that's definitely something to watch. If he's not 100%, then we have a lot of questions around LSU going forward, and then the big question for LSU, particularly on the defense, is are you still fully locked in? You just got absolutely railroaded the last couple of weeks, and you've been doing it in the exact same fashion in the last two games. So can you bounce back? Do you have the mental uh, energy? Do you have the mental toughness to fully bounce back from that and get back on track and play really good defense in this game? 
Maybe not. Maybe they're a team that's just going to sputter at the end of the year and nine and three, eight, eight and four. Wow. And eight and four and be very disappointed about the end of the season. And then for Florida, they need this win about as badly as anyone in the country because if they want to get to bull eligibility, you at least need a win before that Florida State game because I tend to believe they're going to beat Florida State. I think everyone probably believes they're going to beat Florida State right about now. But you need to get there because if you don't, then the next nine months, really, for Billy Napier is going to be just a nightmare. And he's going to have to deal with a million different things while the fans come after him every which way from Tuesday. But a couple of players to watch in this one. Chimery DK has become a huge player for this Florida offense, especially with Elijah Badger and Trey uh, Wilson out. I don't think Trey Wilson's coming back. I'll just leave it at that for the time being. But he had five catches, 95 yards last week against Texas. He's a huge player and definitely someone, regardless of who the quarterback is, they're going to need a little bit of a downfield passing game. And this is a guy that absolutely can do that along with Aiden Mizell, another wide receiver there. But Triquez Bridges is someone on the back end of this defense that I think will be funny, uh, fun to watch in this one because Florida does like to play a little bit more of that zone coverage, a little bit more of that sit back and let your uh, athletic long defensive line go to work. It's going to be interesting to see what Tri uh, Triquez Bridges can do in this one. He is a little bit of a ball hawk, loves to get those picks, and Garrett Nussmeyer can leave the ball up in the air just a little bit too long at times. Maybe that's the moment that Triquez Bridges uh, picks one off and totally changes this game for Florida and really the season for Florida in a lot of ways. Aaron Anderson is the guy I want to watch. Uh, I want you guys to watch, or I will be watching for LSU this upcoming weekend because when you look back at that uh, Florida game, or Florida Texas game, they really struggled with that speed. And t Texas has probably more than uh, more of it than just about anyone in the country. But at the end of the day, Aaron Anderson can do a lot of the things that Isaiah Bond can do. He can do a lot of the things that Silas Bolden, that Matthew Golden can do, and he's a very, very dangerous player. So maybe it's just a screen pass that goes 70 yards because Florida can't wrap him up on one. Definitely something to watch in this one, and I think he could just be a spark plug for this offense. And then Braden Swinson, he has become one of the best edge rushers in the entire conference. And I think when you look at this uh, Florida offense, regardless of if DJ's on the field or if DJ's not on the field, you're going to want to get after the quarterback. DJ can obviously make you hurt a little bit more with his legs, so maybe you'll have to be a little bit more disciplined on the edge if he's in the game just to make sure he doesn't get around. But then if it is um, Aiden Warner, I was blanking on his name there for a second, if it is Aiden Warner, go after him. Just absolutely be on attack mode. Make this guy worried. Make this guy think more than he has to, and definitely you will be able to win this game. So I think they're going to come after him, and I think Braden Swinson is going to be at the very top of that. And then the LSU toughness is something that I'm very interested in here, and it's not to say that I think LSU is going to quit or anything like that, but they did just lose two straight by a combined 44 points. The defense is right back to where it looked like it was last year. There's a lot of fans that are very worried about the future of this program with Brian Kelly at the helm. Are they able to go into a very hostile environment and just get that win? Are they able to just handle their business, continue moving on their way, or... Are they a little bit checked out? Are they a little bit slow to get up for this game? And if uh, Florida goes up 7-0, are they a little bit quick to kind of be like, oh, well, it's happening again type of energy? So definitely something to watch. I tend to believe that they'll still be engaged, but definitely something that could come back to bite them. And then DJ Lagway's health. It's kind of like what we talked about with Taylor Green. If he's on the field, they are a better team, just point blank period. If he's 100%, they're a team that can just outright beat LSU on Saturday. So that's kind of the difference to me. If he's on the field and 80% and 70%, I wouldn't necessarily love Florida. If he's 100% when he gets out there, I might start liking Florida a lot more. And then finally, that Florida fan, uh, fan base, what's the buy-in at this point? How much energy is being put into the 2024 team? 2025, I think they'll be right back up on that horse. But just the question becomes, if LSU goes up early in this one, they score a quick touchdown, maybe get a stop, and then go up 14-0, is there any juice left in that stadium? We saw it in week one when they played Miami. It got out of there in a hurry because they were worried about what this team had. They were worried about the future of this team in that season. And now you're worried about the future beyond this season. So I wonder if uh, LSU gets up 10-0, 14-0 early on in this game, does that place go quiet and just never get loud again? It's going to be something to watch. But I do think this one's going to be close. I just can't pick against LSU. I think LSU gets it done. I think they get it done by about seven points. Frankly, I really, really flirted with putting Florida at 24, putting Florida at 20, even putting him at 28. I really flirted with possibly Florida winning this game because 
I think it's a really sketchy one. I think Florida is just as desperate as ever. And if that team's going to fight the way that they have in the last couple of weeks, I would not count them out of anything. So going to be an awesome couple of games and definitely some games that if Texas were to lose, if if LSU were to lose, we got a lot of questions to answer. I'll just put it that way. But let's take our third break here. And when we come back, we got some upset alerts all around the country that I want to break down for you. We got six here, including Notre Dame, SMU, Oregon, all on some upset alerts going into this week. So we'll break it down right after this.